Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. With Randy Corporan. I'm KLC. This is the podcast for Wake Up Wake with up. Randy Corporan. Listen to Wake Up with Randy Corcoran live Hi. weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on KLZ AM 560 The Source, the Source or through our online stream at 560thesource.com. 560. Share this podcast with your friends and be sure to like us at Facebook at Wake Up Wake with up. Randy Corcoran. On KLZ AM 560 The Source. Every Thursday on Wake Up with Randy Corcoran, Randy invites his old friend and self-proclaimed liberal Dane Torbenson into the studio so the two can duke it out, the important topics of the day. On December 4th, the two were discussing the Ferguson race riots, and Dane suggested that Randy should inform himself by talking to some actual black people. So he did. And Randy had quite a surprise in store for Dane Torbenson. When he showed up the following Thursday, the original air date for this encore hour is December 11th. This is the best of Wake Up with Randy Corcoran on KLZ 560. It's awfully good to have you along. Thursdays, we bring in my longtime friend of, well, just too long to mention. It's been a long time. Dane Torbenson is here. We have a liberal for lunch for an hour every single day and uh, keep the Tums close at hand. Every single Thursday. Every, every single, single Thursday. Day every, probably every single be wear hour. on me too much. <laughs> every single Thursday at 6 o'clock, except Thanksgiving. We, uh, we gave everybody a break that day. So last week, uh, this all started, the conversation... Well, I'll tell you what, I spent a lot of time on the CI interrogation report, so just really, really quick, let me read the uh, final concluding paragraph of this report and get your response to it. Between 1998 and 2001, the Al-Qaeda leadership in South Asia attacked two U.S. embassies in, in East Africa, U.S. warship in the port of Aden, Yemen, and the American homeland, the most deadly single foreign attack on the U.S. in the country's history. The Al-Qaeda leadership has not managed another attack on the homeland in the 13 years since, despite a strong desire to do so. The CIA's aggressive counterterrorism policies and programs are responsible for that success. It's fair to ask whether the interrogation program was the right policy, but the committee never takes on this toughest of questions. Have you had any time to look into this issue yet? I know that the report just came out. I, I've read through some of the executive summary of the report, and the question for me is when you look at the things that the CIA did to people, is that who we want to be as a country? Do we want to sink to that level? Do we want to say the ends justifies the means? And if we do, if as the CIA directors uh, in the Wall Street Journal piece suggest that's what they want to do, that's what they're proud of, then why are we upset when the facts come out? Why didn't we throw this from the rooftops? Why didn't we say to the world, yes, this is what we're doing, and we're proud? Do you really have to ask that question? I do, because... Do you not understand why you don't talk publicly about private interrogation techniques, about the tools that you use to extract this information? Just think about it for a second. I'll give you just a second to think about the most obvious reason why you don't do that. Because if you tell people that the way we get information is by blending it up food and forcing it into someone's anus... They are going to object to it. All right. And, of course, that's a mischaracterization of the medical procedures that went on. That's that's not... But those that's are not, not medically that's not, necessary. But that's not the issue. It was found that none of those procedures you're, used you're were waiting. medically necessary. We have a caller on the line. We're going to get to him in just a second. But that's not the question that I was asking. What's the most obvious reason that you don't tell the world what kind of interrogation techniques that you use? Because the world will object and say, Dane, that is torture. You're being disingenuous right now. Answer the question. You know the reason. I, I know your reason. What's, what is it? That you believe that it would affect national security and uh, hinder attempts to get that information in the future. Because people will prepare against it. Our own Navy SEALs go through waterboarding. Journalists have volunteered for waterboarding to see what it's like. Yes, it's uncomfortable. Yes, it's an appropriate technique. And no, you don't share your interrogation techniques with the world because your enemies will prepare themselves for them. These high-level operatives were well-prepared to be interrogated. New techniques were required to get information. 
nation. Three people were waterboarded after 3,300 Americans were slaughtered with more attacks being planned. And you don't many announce. Innocent, and many innocent people were subjected to these uh, so-called enhanced interrogation techniques. Before we get back to... Um, the, the topic at hand, the Senate, do, do you believe it was good timing for the Senate uh, in, Intelligence Committee to release this report? What was their motivation? There in your is mind? no timing that uh, for release of this report that wouldn't have been criticized. If it had been released six months ago, the Republicans and conservatives would have been all over it as a uh, campaign technique to affect the election. Democrats so, have been in control of Congress for six years. They've had this information together for two years. Why do they wait till after the election before we're supposed to be pulling out of Afghanistan to throw all this out there? They're punishing the American people. I'll tell you why, because the redactions in the report had to be signed off on by the CIA and they were not signed off on until just recently. They could not have re released the report earlier. You never know when, uh, with talk radio, what's going to come up that can change topics and pull us off our game. Uh, when you were here last week, we got into your participation in a rally, uh, Denver rally, in support of Ferguson. Four and a half minutes of silence for the criminal uh, Michael Brown, who was killed by a white policeman. Excuse me, we, criminal, has there been a trial? Have you seen the video? I, have you seen, have have you seen, seen the, the video of video? him? Have you seen the video of him attacking the store owner after he was walking out of the store with unpaid for cigars in his pocket? Have you Did seen you the see portions that? of the video that show what appears to be him paying for the cigarettes? Have you seen what he did to the store owner? Do you really believe that he paid for the cigarillos? Wait. The no one. Uh, Why did the store owner confront him? Why did he grab him around the neck? I exactly. Think, I think because he's a criminal. All right. K. Carl Smith is on the line. You asked me last week um, to that suggested that I should talk to some black people about race relations. So I thought that that was a really, really good idea. And I thought about some of the most prominent um, black conservatives that I know. And K. Carl, K. Carl Smith came to mind. And so K. Carl is on the phone. K. Carl, welcome back to the morning show on KLZ. Hey, good morning to you both. Uh, you and I have not talked about any of this. Um, I gave you a, just a, a three or four sentence synopsis of my conversation with Dane last week and that Dane had said, suggested that I should talk to black people so I could better understand the tensions between uh, black communities and white police officer. So I called you and asked if you could call in and talk about that a little bit and thank you for doing so. Plus, that's not a problem. Would you explain to Dane just a little bit about your background, the kind of community you grew up in? Well, I grew up in, uh, you know, I'm, I'm African American. Grew up in the uh, Birmingham, grew up in Huntsville, Alabama, and uh, grew up in a Democrat Christian home. Okay. Uh, and uh, what was your relationship with your local police force like in your community? You know, what, one thing my dad told me at a young boy, I was about 13 years old, he said, son, the United States has its issues. I said, I'm glad we're here in this country. It's the greatest country in the world, but there's, there's some racist tendencies. He said, son, here's how you deal with police. If you ever stop by police, my dad told me, you always cooperate because they have the upper hand. Don't, don't take that time to be, show your manhood. You cooperate. You come back home and tell me about it so we can deal with it. So that's because he, he told me that because he said he said racism has improved over the years. It hasn't gone away. And since racism is part of this culture, he said, son, you got to understand what you need to do to cope with it and survive through it. He said, you go there. And, and, and it really came true because I was in high school and I had a, um, one night after a football game, a couple of friends of mine went on to eat pizza and then come back home that night. We stopped at a uh, car lot. It was about 11 o'clock at night, just looking at cars. Well, I had an old Bel Air, and the radio didn't work, so in the back seat of my car was a big old boom box. So we got out the car, started looking at cars, and a friend of mine pulled the boom box out, so we walked around the car, uh, looked at these new cars, he had the boom box, listened to music. Walked back to the car, six or seven police cars pulled up in front of us, lights on, uh, I guess guns were drawn, because we couldn't see. And... Uh, and we co I cooperated with my hand against the car. My friend did not cooperate. He was being very uh, uh, 
just voicing his opinion why are you stopping us. And bottom line, he got kind of he got kind of roughed up that night. But the reason why they stopped us is because we had no idea that several weeks in the past uh, they had uh, reports of people stealing radios out of cars. Well, when uh, when they got the report that two black men walk around this new BMW car lot with apparently a radio in their hand, they thought we we're stealing. Uh, radio. Yeah, I just yeah, but, envisioned the the scene <laughs> you were describing. It kind of put a smile on my face. It's pretty yeah. pretty. Now were these white cops that showed yeah, up? I, yeah, I could have visited. Had I not cooperated by putting my hands in this car, not saying a word, uh, you probably have found me somewhere with a bullet in my head because of some accidental shooting. But the whole thing, you, you have to cooperate because and I think it's about mutual respect too. They, we got to respect the law enforcement office, but they got to respect us too by not calling us outside of the name, but treating us with professional courtesy. So it really, it's really a mutual respect kind of thing. And that's, that's what we have to have. Were that's these, my experience in Alabama. Were these white kids, white cops? Most definitely. Okay. Uh, I would love to get your take on what happened in Ferguson, what happened in New York, just the, the short version, but then turn the attention toward these protest rallies that have been popping up. I, I was very critical of my good friend Dane Torbenson for showing up at a rally here in Denver, uh, a rally that was specifically in support of the protesters in Ferguson, and uh, they did a four and a half minute uh, moment of silence for deceased Michael Brown. And it just, I found it very, very upsetting. I'd like to get your take when we come back. You're listening to the best of Wake Up with Randy P. Corporate. So Dane made a very good suggestion last week when I uh, was really critical of him and his participation in the Ferguson rally here in Denver, four and a half minutes of silence for Michael Brown. He said, you know, Randy, you should stop talking to me and talk to some black people about the racial tensions and the relationships with police. And uh, so I've reached out uh, to people. I've asked for uh, black friends to call in. And uh, one of the finest men I know is on the line. The Reverend C.L. Bryant is here to contribute to the conversation. Reverend, welcome to the morning show. It's good to have you. Thank you so much, Randy. Glad to be with you as always. You bet. Uh, CL, Dane and I, I, I really, my frustration with Dane, I, I acknowledged and, and my respect level for people who care enough to get out, stand up for what they believe in. Peaceful protests are certainly a right in this country and uh, can make a, a difference in the, the future progress of our society. The criticism that I had for Dane is that he's contributing to a false narrative, that he's supporting race baiters and race haters by doing what he was doing. And in spite of his brilliance, in spite of his wonderful intentions, his love of country and constitution, um, as a liberal, he's contributing to the problem, and he doesn't know it. And uh, I know he disagrees with that characterization, but as a black man, as a, a black minister, as someone who was a, uh, a, an executive in the NAACP, where do you stand on these issues, uh, considering everything that's gone on over the last few weeks? In the case of Michael Brown, when you support anything uh, surrounding uh, his uh, death, uh, the uh, aftermath of, of his death, as far as uh, protesting for peace or the hands up movement or the die-ins or those types of things, you're actually aiding and abetting bad behavior. Uh, the last uh, known shots of him on film uh, that were captured on film, the last actions of his life indicates that he was uh, involved in a strong armed robbery. Yes, that was him in the in the video. That was him captured on the uh, closed circuit television. And unfortunately, we don't know how long his stepfather was in his life. But if the reactions and the actions of his stepfather was any indication of the example that Michael Brown had, then it is no wonder that his life ended the way that it did, unfortunately. But he did not get killed because of the color of his skin or because of bad police uh, actions. He was killed because of his conduct. He was killed because of his behavior and the foolishness that so many have engaged in over his death is really aiding and abetting a bad situation. 
And what about a, a peaceful protest like the one that Dane participated here in downtown Denver? They they walked to the Justice Center. They had a four and a half minute uh, moment of silence for Michael Brown to represent the four and a half hours that he uh, that his body was uh, laid out in the street. And uh, and I, I just thought, man, your intentions are good and you have no idea what you're contributing to because the race baiters and the haters who are out there uh, making profit and making political mileage off of these events are not on the same agenda that well-intentioned liberals like Dane is on. In our mindset, as far as a dead body is concerned, it should be handled with respect. That was an era in judgment on behalf of the coroner, the city police, whoever was in charge of that. However, I can't tell you how many times a dead body in this country has been mishandled publicly. And uh, yet, uh, it did not create the type of stir or emotion that this did because it was not racial. And in some cases, it did equal race, especially when you're talking about a white person's body that perhaps was mishandled. Again, uh, the, the the story of, of, of humanity is a story of tragedy. I mean, from uh, Genesis all the way uh, through to Revelation. Uh, however, there's triumph there, but still there's tragedy uh, in all of it. And so to take this particular episode in uh, the the history of mankind and turn it into some type of human uh, rallying point for peace or or what have you is totally, uh, in my opinion, is uh, ludicrous. Because this young man was no saint. Uh, He is not any person at all that you would want your children to emulate Unfortunately, his body did lie there in the way we think about those types of things uh, for quite a long time. But in the total scope of our human history, uh, it has happened over and over again, and I'm sure it will happen another time. Well, and, and Reverend Brian, this is Dane Torbenson. I appreciate your comments. I hope you'd agree with me, though, that e- even though Michael Brown was no saint, and even though this moment may not be th- the best example, that it's appropriate to try and use every tragedy as a fulcrum point to try and make the world better. And th- the fact that it's a tragedy does not mean that we shouldn't try and prevent future tragedies. And there are, you know, there may be kids out there who are saints who, if we don't fix the problems in our country, could have interactions with the police that turn fatal, even when they've done nothing wrong. And that's, that's what we need to try and prevent, not to change the past, but to fix the future. Dane, we talked about uh, false narratives. When we look at uh, 2014, now, I grew up in the the segregated South. I'm a black man who who didn't grow up in Colorado or California or even New York City, for that matter, um, where you do have uh, some things that are going on right now over Garner that are questionable. However, in the segregated South, I can tell you that there were times when black youths whether they were good kids or not, did in fact have reason to fear the police. I am living in the year 2014 now and nearly 60 years old. And I can tell you that as good as it is now for everyone, including black youths across the country, it was just that bad then for black youths in the South. I run into angry young men in inner city Chicago, and I run into angry young men in Detroit and New York City. And let me tell you what I know for a fact. They tell me that they're angry. No, I'm the one who should be angry, because there was literally a time when I was not afraid of other black men. I was not afraid of being shot down in drive-bys and those types of things. I was truly afraid of what may happen by some cop who was a part of the Klan. That is not in any way, shape, or form what it is now. 
But you do have people who would like to relive those times. And that's the false narrative that is being perpetrated as a lie on the American public today. This hands up movement, this laying down and dying. I, I remember a time when I could not go into a store that did that resembled Macy's in the South. I, and I, my, I remember when my mom had to get out of line to be wait if a white woman wanted to be waited on to buy her socks. This is a false narrative. And I'm telling you, there is a design here that would like to bring back the 50s, that would like to bring back the 60s. And, and what side of the political spectrum is that designer on, C.L. Bryant? That is the Democrat Party. The party that Dane Torbenson supports in spite of his good intentions. The, the, party, the party that freed us from that mindset. The party that elected the first congressmen and black senators to the House and the Senate. The party that, in fact, did not elect its first senator, black, uh, senator to office until Carol Mosley Braun. The party that has spawned Al Sharpton and people like that. That's the party who, in fact, inflicts uh, it's in its platform or placed in its platforms the idea that it's okay to kill 40 percent of African American babies. Well, you know, 43 percent of all abortions in this country are black babies, and we're only 13 percent of the population. Yet that party and its president and most of its minions who are in Congress support that genocide that's the party that also is not saying anything when black youths in chicago are murdering each other but yet they're supporting the true backers of this movement who are the wall street occupiers in carrying on the die-ins and the hands up movement oh yeah we know who this is it's not republicans these are democrats and the purpose in it is to create an underclass. This is the party that is welcoming in people who will actually replace those young black people in the job market. If, in fact, this president, a Democrat, and his administration has their way, that's the party that I'm talking about. And it's the same party who lynched black people in the South and Republicans who tried to help them. That's the party I'm talking about. And C.L. Bryant, we had K. Carl Smith on earlier, and he he directed Dane to the uh, Democrat website, their, their history page, where they talk about being the party that has been focused on, uh, on racial freedom and, and racial equality quality since its inception and so the the whole very premise of the history of the democrat party is a lie isn't it it's a lie it is built on the word you use uh randy false narrative they would not have even passed the civil rights lyndon johnson could not have signed the civil rights act if it was not for republicans because democrats including john kennedy had voted it down back in 1957. That's the party. Reverend C.L. Bryant, uh, you know, you fully well understand the constraints of uh, time on talk radio. We appreciate the generosity of yours this morning. Hope to have you back when we can talk about other things, uh, but really appreciate your hard work out there and especially appreciate you weighing in this morning on this conversation as we have a liberal for lunch here on KLZ 560. Have a great day, sir, and thank you very much. God bless. Bye now. It's the morning show. Wake up with Randy Corcoran. Another encore segment of Wake Up with Randy Corcoran. Our Have a Liberal for Lunch segment. Right now, Derek Wilburn is on the line. Derek Wilburn, the founder of American Conservatives of Color, joins us. Derek, I don't know how much of the conversation you've had an opportunity to hear, uh, but I sure appreciate you calling in. Um, I have been uh, raising strong objections to, for instance, Dane's participation in the Ferguson, Denver in support of Ferguson rally, four and a half minutes of silence for Michael Brown, um, because it contributes to uh, what I call a false narrative, and uh, and he's well-intentioned. I don't think he gets it. Uh, you're a member of the black community. What say you? 
RC, my other brother from another mother, let me ask you a question. Have you ever in your life enjoyed a glass of white Zinfandel? I have. You're a racist. I know. Okay, you are a racist. That's your problem. Uh, you know, you're right. It is a false narrative. Not a single one of the individuals called to testify before the grand jury, three-month-long trial, not a one of them corroborated the narrative that Michael Brown was on his knees with his hands up in the I surrender position and was shot by that officer. Not one. His blood was found 25 feet from his body. Now, you would think that if you're on your knees with your hands up and someone shoots you, that both you and your blood would be in the same place. Well, and I, and I, you know, the, the Dane's response will be grand jury's not a trial. There was other evidence. You can pick and choose. You can cherry pick. But I, I think moving on from the particular facts of that case, what I object to is contribute, contributing to the motivations of the progressive left who are out there stirring up social unrest, who are trying to create racial tensions and racial divides and are actually uh, exacerbating them, not making them better. Nothing's getting better. No, where we need to focus on, in my opinion, in the timeline of that young man getting shot, isn't the, the situation in which he was shot, but the hour or two before. So when we in the black community get to the point where we aren't robbing stores, treating cops disrespectfully, when a cop tells you, get off the street on the sidewalk, you say, yes, sir. And then you don't so much run the risk of getting shot. So, the, the, I mean, my thing is truth transcends color, as you well know. What is the truth? And what these people are out there protesting, and, and it sounds like Dane is one of them, is a storyline that's simply not true. So why are we promoting a lie? And it's a lie that this man was simply hunted down and, and executed by a cop. And the truth of the matter is, we do not have an epidemic in this country of police hunting and killing black men. We just don't. We do have an epidemic of black men killing black men, but you don't see a lot of protests about that. Dane? Well, actually, the statistics show that... Um you know what's referred to as black on black crime is reduced by forty percent in in the last uh, couple of decades. So that's good. It's still a problem, uh, and I agree with you that that's a significant problem. But it's not the only problem. And Randy keeps referring to this as some sort of top down movement that it's being fomented by those above. When I went to the rally, and this is my experience, the people there, I, I mean, these, these were people from all over, young and old, from all walks of life. They weren't there because someone told them uh, a false narrative. They were there because they felt, and their personal experiences were such, that they realized there's a problem in this country that we need to address. And that's why people got up, and that's why people are getting up and going out and making these statements. My objection is that they are supporting, the top-down leaders are fomenting civil unrest. They're not fomenting a conversation. And Dane, naively, with his protest, contributes to that false narrative. Conversation continues. Stay with us. PAC Studio. We usually turn our attention to Mark Baisley at this time, the Vice Chairman of the Colorado State Republican Party. Mark is here. Welcome. Good morning. Excuse me. Good morning, Ray. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't wake you outside. I hope we didn't wake you. Wake up. Yeah. Uh, Dane Torbenson stays with us because we've got a couple of callers that uh, we wanted to clear as we continue our conversation. Uh, I had expressed my objection to his participation to the false narrative. Uh, being promoted by leadership from Barack Obama to Eric Holder, Al Sharpton, on down over the incidents that occurred in Ferguson. And uh, uh, first thing I wanted to say, Dan, I took a moment to be looking at your Facebook page during the last break, and you've got a picture of Barack Obama pardoning a white turkey. Do you know how many white turkeys he condemned to die when he took that action? Your president is a racist. 
I, and I'm just concerned about the executive amnesty that he exercised on that turkey. We're going to have a flood of turkeys in this country. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. This conversation's not going to turn into a turkey because it's way too important. And Derek Wilburn was kind enough to hold over during the top of the hour break. Uh, Derek, you heard Dane's final comments. You heard mine. This contribution to a false narrative that does harm to black and white relationships, that does harm to the relations between police officers and the black communities. That's why I object to supporting uh, going to that protest and that rally here in Denver in support of Ferguson, because it it supports the wrong narrative. Uh, I agree. You know, I I think the Danes of the world are well-intentioned, and and I don't think there's any question about that. But my point was and continues to be that it is focusing on the wrong, we're chasing the wrong rabbit. There is no epidemic in this country of white cops killing black men. There just is not. But in Chicago, Illinois, city of my birth, in one weekend, July 4th weekend this last summer, 46 black men shot dead by other black men. Where were the protesters? Where were the Danes of the world saying, we've got to make some changes here in this community? Yes, police brutality exists. Nobody claims that it doesn't exist. It does. Racism exists in the ranks of police force. Yes, it does. But it's not an epidemic. It's not killing us the way we are killing us. We're focusing on the wrong rabbit here. Derek, uh, we've got some other callers on the line. I appreciate you hanging on. I know you've got a busy day ahead. I hope we can have you back on the show sometime to talk about what you're up to. Uh, But have a terrific day. Thanks very much for being with us on the KLZ Morning Show. Casper, Casper, you've been holding a good long time. I appreciate it. Uh, You're a black man as well. You've been listening to this, almost this entire conversation, I think. Uh, What say you to Dane's position that, uh, you know, he's really trying to make a difference by showing up and standing for four and a half minutes silence on behalf of Michael Brown. Yeah, I've been listening to the entire conversation, and it's a big problem with the, the mentality uh, from the progressive left. You know, I think I, I think I'm gonna write a book, uh, how to the proper care and feeding of the Negro, because what's happening is they are trying to corral these uh, people in the community and just take care of them and protect them and feed them, and you know, we can go back to what Frederick. Frederick Douglass said many, many, many years ago when he was asked what to do about the Negro, and he said, do nothing. They are killing the population. They've been doing it for the past 60 years that I've seen uh, by these movements. It's not helping. It's hurting. It's just like Derek was saying. uh, You know, it's hurting the community, and they go to these rallies, you know, the Danes and and others go to the rallies, and I'm quite sure he has very well intentions. But what happens after the rally? We've been talking about this for 60 years. So what happens after the rally? What do we do to correct the problem? The rally doesn't fix the problem. We can talk about it until the cows come home. What Dane, are we going to do? Dane, what happened after the rally? What happened after the rally is that we've had these conversations for the last three weeks. We have been talking about the issue. We're not burying it. But we're not talking about the issue. You've heard from black leader, national black leaders, local black leaders, uh, black person after black person today. Go ahead, Casper. what they're doing. They're complaining about the issue. They are not talking about it. They're complaining about it. The president complains about people talking about him because he's black. You know what? He's the leader of the free world. Who cares what somebody says that he's black or not? Yeah, don't we have the strongest example of the advancements that have been made in the United States on racism by looking at who the attorney general is, looking at who the two-term president of the United States is? I mean, why aren't we celebrating our progress and talking about the real issues, not holding up uh, the death of a black criminal, tragic as it may have been, as some kind of an example of a problem in the country that doesn't exist in the way that the attention that you're bringing to would make one think that it does. What? It's, a very, it's a very simple solution, Dan, and, and, and the solution is stop talking about it and do something about it. What can you do? Well, you can go back to the community and roll your sleeves up and help those people, teach them how to fish. That's what you could be doing. Going to a rally does not teach them how to fish. All it does is teach them how to complain. And how can to do something? Casper, like what's your background? Where where did you grow up? Um, what what has your experience been with 
white police yeah. officers or police in general? Yeah, I grew up in the in the north. I grew up in Connecticut, and my parents did not have the conversation with me about prejudice. But what they did do is teach me some common sense. And common sense says that if you are committing a crime, or even if you're not committing a crime, and you get pulled over by the cops, it's probably a good idea to follow their instructions. Yeah, I mean, that's the bottom line, isn't it? That that's the message that ought to be sending right now. You're at a disadvantage if you're confronted by police. Yeah, and I've, I've known plenty of white kids that have gotten beaten up by cops because they had a smart mouth. Yeah, a- absolutely. I... Uh, I'm just so frustrated by this because the the president, Eric Holder, Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson, those people are not interested in trying to heal race relations. They are trying to foment civil unrest right now to their political advantage. And well-intentioned, well-meaning, country-loving, family-raising, liberals like you, Dane, you contribute to that entire mess. Well, you talk about a false narrative, but... This narrative isn't being imposed on these people. These people are creating their own narrative. The protests, you're trying to say that the protests are caused by Al Sharpton, by the president, by uh, Eric Holder. And, and that's not the No, I'm saying that, that their responses. The Go ahead, Casper. It's very simple, okay? Al Sharpton gets on the news, and they put him on the news, and he says, we're going to hold rallies across the nation because of this injustice. The president has Al Sharpton into the White House and says, good job, Al. What do you call that? That is <laughs> that is ginning up the wrong uh, thing. He should, the president simply should get on the news and say, look, there's always going to be problems um, in our country about race, but we live in a, a fantastic, awesome country. Do we have problems? Of course we do. We're going to always have problems. So let's work on solutions. Yeah, and, not destroy other people's property. Otherwise, you're going to jail. Yeah. And, and, and here's what I, as the first black president of the United States of America, promised that I would be able to do with my extreme ability, my talents of communication. Uh, I was the president who was going to bridge the gap, who was going to cross the lines, who was going to bring both sides of the political spectrum together, who was going to help heal racial divides in the country. And instead, uh, look how far we've fallen. Alan, Al, not so Sharpton versus um, uh, Martin Luther King for our racial leadership for the black community in the country. Uh, Dane, that should tell you everything you need to know about the political party that you support. At this rally, it wasn't Al Sharpton driving it. It was the individual people who showed up. This wasn't something that was organized as part of a uh, mass response to Al Sharpton's comments. This was people gathering to try and address a problem. He wasn't at the rally, but he definitely was was the catalyst, along with the president and along with the very uh, ra- race, racist uh, um, attorney general. Why, why, Dane, didn't the president come out and say there is no evidence right at this time that this shooting was racially motivated? Until we have the facts, until we understand what's going on, everyone stay calm. We don't heal ourselves this way. You, and they did these- it during the Trayvon Martin. They did it the same exact thing. Yeah, remember his little beer summit after a black professor got belligerent with police who saw him what looked like breaking into a house, and uh, until they had him identified as actually the owner of the house, he'd locked himself out. They were treating him like a suspect, and he got belligerent with them. And the police said that the, or the president said that those police acted stupidly before he knew a thing about what went on in that incident. These are examples of how these leaders that you support, Dane, uh, are using these these kinds of opportunities to foment social unrest and to create a false narrative. And your well-intentioned inter- rallying without calling them out for it contributes to the problem. Pointing yeah. out problems is not fomenting social unrest. But Pointing to... Uh, have you been watching the news? Do you see what's happening? A you, President Obama really could tamp that down in a matter of minutes by saying the right words. Go ahead, Casper. I'm sorry. If you if you really want to solve the problem, then, and and I believe that you are are, are are truly concerned about it, but if you want to solve the problem, then you join us, roll up your sleeves alongside of us, because we're going into the community to solve the problem. Not to talk about it anymore, because we know what the problem is. We don't need to talk about Talk about what? Talk about the fact that 
black people are being pulled over by cops, guess what? That's going to continue to happen for the rest of our lives. What are we going to do about it? Well, and I agree with you 100% that the solutions don't lie in the conversation, but the conversation gets people motivated to seek solutions. And so I, I agree that what needs to happen is rolling up the sleeves, going into the communities, teaching people how to fish, as you say. I, I believe that encouraging okay, so economic when, so activity is one of the most important that? things. When are you going to join us to do that instead of doing what you're doing right now, which is hurting the community? Dane, what most of the people that showed up at this rally were doing, and, and I hope this doesn't apply to you, is they were making themselves feel good about themselves. Oh, this is such a terrible problem. I'm going to stand up and do something. doesn't solve a thing. And you contribute to these extreme race baiters like Al Sharpton and Jesse Jackson, Jackson continuing their message, continuing their divisive policies and their divisive statements by doing it. And, I, and you just don't realize it. Can I say this, Randy? If, yeah. It, if, if Al Sharpton had a plan to do something, I actually would support it and him. But and I'd quit calling him Al not so Sharpton if that were the case. But in 30 years, we've got proof that that's never been part of his agenda. No, it's never been. He's a self-promoter, a race baiter, and a race hater. He's made millions on these uh, um, issues. And he is the president that you supported and voted for twice. He's his wingman on the issue of racial tensions in the United States of America. It's pathetic. Casper, thank you for your patience. Thank you for your contributions this morning. Uh, we can't You're keep welcome. Dane any longer, but I really do appreciate you, and I hope you'll call in often on the KLZ Morning Show. I sure will. Take care. All right. It's 718, and um, Dane, a my Facebook has been going crazy. Just a couple of things I'll share with you. Mark wrote, we don't need to fix it, as Dane keeps saying. We just need to let it heal. We have all the laws and processes in place. So just let racism fade away on its own over time. Do that by contributing to the economic development, the education in these communities. Give choice back to these families. Look seriously. You heard from C.L. Bryant. You heard a little bit from K. Carl Smith. Look seriously at the policies of the Democrat Party and what the actual... Not what the nice, good intentions that the educated liberals have in, in using these policies, but what the results of these policies have been. And work hard to change those approaches to things that actually work. Take a look at conservative principles. You'll see that they are the ones that work. Well, and I think some of those are really good ideas. But to say that all we need to do is let it fade away, we've been trying that, and it has not worked. And you are attempting to impose your narrative on these protests just as much as you accuse President Obama and Eric Holder and Al Sharpton of attempting to impose their narrative. No, Dane. Let's listen Dane. to the protesters and listen to their narrative. I saw on your narrative. Facebook, Black Lives Matter, hashtag Black Lives Matter, instead of Lives Matter, All Lives Matter. You admitted on this show that you walked that you walked walked around, hands up, don't shoot. That's the false narrative, and you jumped in like a liberal lapdog to, to encourage that kind of response from people. It is not and it a, does damage. It is not a false narrative to say that interactions of police with people of color start out more aggressively. They escalate more quickly. Hands up. Do you admit hands people. up, don't shoot is a false narrative? No. You admit that that's not what happened with it, Michael Brown? I admit it may... The, Evidence is unclear. We don't know what happened. I don't know one way or another. But whether or not it happened with Michael Brown, it's not a false narrative for millions of people in the country. Final comment on Facebook, anyway, from Jerry. Here's some Chicago information for Dane. From the time Michael Brown died in August to November 29, 154 people died of street violence in Chicago. 116 of those people killed were black. Most of those killings don't even have suspects. Where's the outrage for those black lives? If black lives truly matter, start demanding that Obama's hometown under Rahm Emanuel start caring about Chicago black lives. I think uh, every life matters. I think black lives matter in Chicago. I think there should be outrage about how many people are dying across this country needlessly. Hands up, don't shoot. Did that, that really helped the conversation, didn't it? I, I, yes, I think it does. Fair enough. We always try to leave Dane with the last word and let him speak for himself. Stay with us. It's KLZ 560. 
Hey, it's Randy Corcoran. Thanks for listening to the podcast of our show, Wake Up with Randy Corcoran. Don't forget, I'm chairman of the Arapahoe County Tea Party. Our meetings are the second Tuesday of every month at 6.30 p.m. with candidates, elected officials, and topics of interest to freedom lovers everywhere. No matter where you're listening, please find us on Facebook and Google the Arapahoe Tea Party. This is the best of Wake Up with Randy Corcoran on KLZ 560. Our next guest, we're going to have to lay some ground rules for Lily Tang Williams, uh, former libertarian candidate for Colorado's House District 44, made national news when she spoke to the Colorado Department of Education, Board of Education, uh, State Board, and said that the Common Core reminds her of the Communist Core that she saw when she lived in China. And so, Lily, you've been on the show before, and I think it's really important that we need to lay some ground rules for you. First one is, I know you're very laid back, kind of shy, and so we've got to try and get you to kind of break out of your shell this morning. Can we do that? Well, thanks for having me back, uh, Randy. Good morning. <laughs> yeah, you're 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 just a, a knockout puncher. You've been uh, you've sp- spoken to the Arapo Tea Party. You've been on uh, KLZ shows before, including the morning show, and. Um, uh, what I love about listening to your story is that, uh, uh, unlike, for instance, an earlier caller, Andy Pate, who grew up a leftist, who grew up in a Democrat family, who matured and, and, and got to the other side, you have actually lived in a civilization, in a society that uh, has reached the ultimate end of progressivism. You've lived in communist China. Right, I am um, believing history, and sometimes I cannot help it. I, I people say I open my mouth, fires come out because uh, I just feel so passionate. Um, because I live through it, and the once I come out of it, I can never go back. I just recognize what is going on in this country. It really remind me, you know, how I live through China. So I just wanted to tell people, hey, it did not work. It was very scary. And, of course, I was born right before the Cultural Revolution, the Chinese political social chaos, where Mao used his power to purge his enemies, then used young people through communist education to get them to be, you know, like violent and used by the party and do all the power struggles, then send them to countryside for 10 years. What a lost generation. And my uncle was one of them. So I grew up in that kind of system. I did not know anything better. I was a, such an indoctrinated child. And um, so when when I was growing up, for example, you go to school every day. In the morning, you, you, you have to chant. You have to sing revolutionary songs. You have to say, I love Chiang Mai Mao. I love Communist Party. Then we start to do our days, uh, you know, um, studies and and mostly, um, you know, of course, the language and the math and some other subjects. And then during middle lunch break, and then you start to do all that political stuff again. And um, it just, uh, you know, you do that for 10 years. I wonder why people sometimes just cannot even come out of it. Well, it's it's just remarkable to imagine. We we here who have had the blessings of being born in America and growing up in the 60s and the 70s and and living through the Reagan revolution and and all of that. It's it's more a philosophical conversation. It's an examination of history. It's kind of a oh man, how could any society ever wind up in the hands of someone like Chairman Mao? Uh, but what happened is, and, and the numbers vary, but the estimates of the people who were murdered under that regime are between 40 and 70 million. And I guess I shouldn't say murder necessarily, because some of it was through starvation, forced labor, and executions. But 40 to 70 million people who died because of these policies, because of this philosophy of government. And so you went through all these. What do you think when you see what's happening, the uh, protests, the chanting, the rioting in Ferguson, this false argument that's being made about uh, the danger to black people uh, from police officers and that sort of thing? Well, I always uh, wanted to remind people, I said, uh, you know, be aware we are all people in this country. We are the citizens. We need to be united. You know, people sometimes are very naive, just believe what the medium said, what the government wants them to believe. 
I want to tell you a lesson, which is、uh, to me, you know, when the government wants to be in control, they tend to divide our people. All these racial、um, tensions and all those、um, lots of going on in this country, and、uh, government is turning us against each other. You know, this group, that group. What Mao did is that we had a political class. So if you were born peasants, workers, and you know military families, government officials, you are the good class, and that class actually is in your file, in your household registration system to name you, label you. Then if you are born into you know, business owners, you know like the land owners, international scholars, you are the bad class. So we we need to be aware not to be labeled by the government. What kind of class people we are? Another war on women, war on this and that, and、uh, we need to be united, focus on some issues we have and fix together, but not through riots, not through looting, and、uh, and this is、uh, of course the militarization of the police. It is worrying me some because.、Uh, You know, I grew up in the police state where police brutality is just、uh, you have no idea. You know, they can knock on your door, kick your door open, two o'clock in the morning. And I was a child who was very feared for my family and security, and afraid that、uh, someday, you know, one of my family member would be just、uh, detained, arrested without any court papers, and just taken away. So, so my message to people is always: we need to be careful. We need to be united each other. We are more loyal to our freedom, to our principles, instead of other things that、uh, you know some people want you to believe. Lily Tang Williams, when did you first come to the United States? I came over here to go to graduate school in 1988. That's one year before Tiananmen Square, and.、Um, Before I came, I, I basically gave up on communism on my country. I went to law school at the age of 16 when I realized my favorite math teacher was in such good、um, bad health because he was sent to re-educational camp because he, like other young people educated, were encouraged by the party in the great leap forward in the 50s to say, "Hey, if you come out, give us feedback to the party." You know, we really like to have you true feedback. So they were naive. They trust the party. They said they gave them a feedback to say this policy is not right. We should do this way. You know, criticize them basically. Then his generation all were sent to countryside and re-education. You know, of course,、uh, very harsh living conditions and you know bad sanitary environment. He got really sick, and he told me when I was 15 in high school, our country is not ruled by law. Our country is ruled by men. So at that point, I said, "Oh, since college is open now, I'm going to go to law school, study, and transform China from rule of, you know, man to rule of law." And people will say, "Hey, good luck, Lily Han, in this country." Of course, I was very disappointed. I could not even one later. I realized, you know, this is going to continue. This is a one-party dictatorship with communism ideology. And、um, so before I came over here, I realized they want to hammer me down because I was too individualistic for them, and、uh, I had to leave、um, for a free country like the United States. All right. So you came to the United States in the '80s. You're now a United States citizen. How long did that take? Um, I I got a, a little bit easier than most of legal immigrants because I、uh, married、um, to an American citizen. So once you got married, you go through this very strict、uh, interview process. You want to make sure you really sleep together in the same bedroom. You are making you are not making that up, and it's kind of you know humiliating process. And I took the test and. And、uh, so I become citizen after I got my green card when I first got married. Then you wait for five years, and to prove your relationship is real, then you become U.S. citizen. And I wanted to become citizen because、uh, my husband and I went to China in the 1990s. You know me; I'm just a you know straight talker. Same thing come out of my you know heart. If people ask me questions about United States, about China, I will give them my honest views. My husband, as American citizen, is I just get worried. So maybe you got to be careful what you say in China. He he said I don't want to disappear one day. So he said you got to become citizen, and then you have some protection. And then over the years, I learned about constitution. I, I I love this country. You know, I was I I was feeling free for a while, and、uh, and I said yeah, why not become U.S. citizen? Then I can vote. I can make my voice heard because I never voted when I was growing up in China. 
and even some citizens can vote and today now but it's not really voting just like Hong Kong they give you one two three choices and you pick it's nominated by the Communist Party they're not honoring the agreement one country two systems that's why you have seen Hong Kong students take on the street for a long time about two months and they just decided to retreat because of some danger they're facing it is it is sad when you say they signed the agreement and Hong Kong people was hopeful. Well, Lily, I want I wanted to take some time to I, I wanted to take some time to talk about your histories just so people would understand how poignant, how powerful the comments that you made to the Colorado State Board of Education were. So when we come back, let's take the final segment that we have with our guest Lily Tang Williams and talk uh, strictly about your opposition to Common Core and how you presented that information in a story that's gone national now. Common Core, in my eyes, is the same as the Communist Core I once saw in China. Our guest Lily Tang Williams grew up in Communist China. She has the true perspective who, as someone who's lived under both styles of government. She's expressed her fear about what's happening to the United States of America and she expressed her opposition to the Communist Core, I mean to the Common Core, to the Cotto State Board of Education and the story that's gone national. We'll get that story from her when we come back. Stay with us. It's Wake Up with Randy Corplin on KLZ 560. You're listening to the best of Wake Up with Randy P. Corporate. So pleased to be joined by Lily Tang Williams, former Libertarian candidate in HD24. We've linked up to a great version of her story on Breitbart.com. A Chinese immigrant mother of three testified before the Colorado State Board of Education that the Common Core is the same type of education system she experienced growing up in communist China. Lily, tell us all about that. That must have been quite an afternoon or evening. Right. I, when I went to the board, it was uh, very cold that day. We had a few parents there. I was giving three minutes to give a public comment. So I told them passionately. I said, I grew up in Mouth, China, where we had a nationalized testing, curriculum, and indoctrination. I said, why are you doing this in this country, in our state? Education is really supposed to belong to parents and local schools. And I told them about the child file, the data collection, data mining of our children. It's just a very, very scary stuff to me. And I had to, you know, jump on this and fight this because the more I know about Common Core, the more scared I become. It just reminds me all the things I, you know, grew up in China. And, and for example, the AP U.S. history test, they, they, they just took out lots of real history stuff. And they don't want to encourage you to talk about capitalism, free entrepreneurship, American exceptionalism. And to me, that means the government will control agenda, what they want your children to learn, and what they even want you to know. And uh, I, I feel so scared because uh, once the communism took over, they always take over your children. They always wanted to put them together, declare they belong to the state, and then will nationalize the education, central top down. And your parents have no say, have no choice, and have no voice. It's very scary stuff. So I'm telling my story to tell people, we got to fight. It doesn't matter how wonderful they make Common Core sounds like. It doesn't matter how many corporations come in with money, embed with government to push this. We, as a parent, got to keep our children, got to have control in our kids' education. Otherwise, this country will not be a same America I come here for. We're talking to Chinese immigrant Lily Williams about her addressing the Colorado State Board of Education about the Common Core being just like the Communist Core. Let's focus a minute on the data collection, Lily. Uh, let me just read a quote. You, you can see the entire three minutes that she was given to address the board by going to our Facebook page, Wake Up with Randy Corporan. You told the board that the government used the household registration and personnel file system to keep track of its citizens from birth to death. This old photo of me in Mao's Red Guard uniform was used in my middle school student file, which documented everything, age, gender, parents, their jobs and political class, religion, siblings, home address, your grades, awards, punishments, politically incorrect speeches, bad behaviors. Then this file followed me to my high school, college, first job, future jobs. It was shared by all the government agencies and employers. That's what went on in communist China. Why are you concerned that communist Common Core brings the same thing to the United States of America. 
because the common core, I'm afraid, will be used by our government to collect the same kind of data. We had to, you know, get the Chinese government, that spot the government control. Uh, even though they might say they want to use data to analyze the children's performance, but uh, each child will be followed, analyzed. Like in Florida, when Jack Bush started to implement common core, and, you know, they were doing some eye tests, you know, eye exams or maybe even fingerprinting. And they're going to ask your parents' political party affiliations. All this stuff is just very, very scary because we're learning in school, which is expected. Oh, they're going to collect data. They're going to have a file on us. I, by the way, I never saw that file, and uh, nor my parents. So you don't know what's in it. And we were supposed to te- tell teachers, confess confess our incorrect thoughts every day and write diaries, turn over diaries for teachers to review. I learned very quickly, I'm not going to turn in my true personal diary. I'm going to turn my political correct one for them to review. Otherwise, you will get into trouble. So in this country, if we let the government do that, how scary will that become? You have no more privacy. You have no more and uh, parental control. And NSA is already doing lots of crap to us as citizens, monitor us. But now they can do that to our children. That once your children got hooked, once they grow up indoctrinated by the um, government, when they grow up become 20 years old, Think of what kind of you know citizens they will be. They will not be critical thinkers. They will be just tax takers and uh, corporation workers and employee mentality. And that's very scary because I want my kids to be like Bill Gates, to be entrepreneur, start business, and to challenge authority. And I don't want my kids to become like the people in China. Kids today, they don't think. They just go take tests. They go serve. They go work. They make money. You know, it's like. A, they even don't know how brainwashed they were because today's kids have to take a politics study in their subject. The politics study means whatever the party wants to learn. It's all nationalized. The leaders on the, in the Democrat Party are trying to grow up a generation of servants, of robots, to serve the leadership class, to adopt their leftist ideology. Right. And you said to the board that you grew up in that system. You came to America for freedom. You can't believe this is happening all over again in this country. And I love this last sentence. I don't know what happened to America, a shining city on a hill for freedom. What's going on in this country? Uh, good friend, regular listener Kim texted me, Commie Core. I, I think that should be the hashtag that goes out about the Common Core. Uh, Lily Williams, we've only got a minute or so left, but uh, what do you want parents to know, people to know? How can we push back against Commie Core? I like that name, and some of my Facebook friends actually suggested, really from now on, we're just going to call your name with Kami Call, and I cannot sugarcoat it. My message to parents is that uh, get involved, get informed, and uh, take action. This is a critical battle. I mean, I feel so passionate about this. It's, it's going to open up a floodgate for the parents to come in to nationalize our education, even our teachers' colleges. That's one of the agenda they're going to do. We got to fight back. You know, turn down my open letter I sent to all over the country. Use my open letter, my video, go to your school board meetings and tell people my story, share it, and to fight back to say, I don't want my kids to be like her as a child, got indoctrinated by the communist education, by the central top-down, one size fits all. We want our choice in school education. We want our children, our schools back. Lily, it's great, great stuff. I don't know if you'll be attending the Arapaho Tea Party meeting next Tuesday, but if you do, I'd sure be happy to give you uh, 10 or 15 minutes to tell your story to our group there. And uh, we have linked up to the article from Breitbart.com. You can see the entire three-minute uh, video, the lecture that our guest Lily Williams gave to the Colorado State Board of Education. A very, very important message. I appreciate that you're out there delivering it. And Lily, I hope you'll come back and talk to us again real soon on Wake Up with Randy Corcoran. You're listening to the best of Wake Up with Randy P. Corcoran. Welcome back to KLZ Morning Show. I'm Randy Corcoran. It's good to have you along. We've been talking all morning long about how we have to take action today and tomorrow to notify members of Congress that they cannot fund Obama's executive amnesty. We've linked up on our Facebook page, Wake Up with Randy Corcoran, to a letter from Jenny Beth Martin that gives the targeted Congress members with their phone numbers what we need to tell them. 
RedState.com, Eric Erickson, we've linked up to their call center. You have to tell them no continuing resolution that funds executive amnesty and no rule on the continuing resolution that funds executive amnesty. Got to put that part in. Just go to our Facebook page, check it out. The instructions are right there. It's Wake Up with Randy Corcoran, but today and tomorrow are it. Lori texted me this morning, hearing from the people gives politicians political cover and support to do the right thing. And if we rise up, if the phone lines are burned up over the next day or two, some marginal politicians who are on the fence about this issue can say, hey, I heard from my constituents. They don't want it, and I've got to help be a part of stopping it. The other side is why. Why is it so important that we not let this illegal executive action stand? What are the real-life consequences? Immigration expert and author Roger Fleming joins us now, and he says that thousands of illegal immigrant children are coming to a school near you. Mr. Fleming, welcome back to The Morning Show. Thanks for having me. Good to have you along. You've got a new book out. Let's talk about that for a minute before we get into the immigration issue. Majority Rules, a uh, novel by Roger Fleming, uh, looks very, very interesting, and it's written by someone who's been inside Beltway politics. Yeah, I came to Washington in the uh, mid-'80s as a young lawyer, and I was stunned when I got here to find out I was working for a Republican congressman from Florida, my hometown, and found out because he was in the minority then, um, Democrats had been in the majority in the House for 30 straight years, had a, about a 70-seat majority, that my congressman had no no rights, no power. He couldn't you know, call a hearing on any subject. He couldn't ask a witness to testify at a hearing. He couldn't use a committee room for any reason. So I... It kind of always stuck in my craw, and I started writing this book about eight years ago about that and what I saw and the sort of games I saw that the majority um, party then you know, played on the Republican minority and how they skewed the outcomes in so many important issues, including immigration reform. And It's a novel, but it runs through the, the characters are working on the uh, Immigration Act of 1986, and they stumble upon a human smuggling cartel and get in all kinds of trouble. Yeah, it sounds very, very interesting, and it's it's especially uh, unique timing now for people who might be looking for kind of an escape, some reality in the new book, Majority Rules, from Roger Fleming. But the Republicans are going to be in the majority, and and the question is, we already have uh, Mitch McConnell coming out and saying that he's going to return the Senate to being the deliberative body that it should be. Uh, he's not going to take advantage of majority rules the way the Democrats have since all the way back in 2006. And, and I think that's a mistake. I think you have to punish the other side with the rules that they have made and the procedures that they have put in place to teach them never, ever do that again, because power does change in Washington, D.C., yeah, well, I think what I've heard McConnell say is that he's going to return the Senate to regular order, uh, make bills come through the committee process and work their way up to the leadership and onto the floor. And I think there's some, I think there's some, a lot of good that could come from that, especially if you're thinking about, you just mentioned the spending bills on immigration. If, if the appropriations process goes back to the way it used to be, where each bill comes through separately, including the bill for the Department of Homeland Security, and they can look at it specifically and make cuts here and there, instead of wrapping it into one continuing resolution where everybody has to vote to either fund the whole government or shut the government down, I think that will be to the benefit of, uh, of Republicans going forward. Well, I hope you're right. I, uh, what I think will happen, especially if the nuclear option is also removed once Republicans are back in control, is that Democrats will simply stand up and and be a, a stumbling block to anything, any government-reducing legislation that might come out of a Republican-led Congress. I don't know. But uh, that wasn't the purpose of our conversation with you. You've got this great book, and we all know that... Uh, the funding, uh, the decision to be, is about to be made, whether the illegal amnesty will be funded. And there are real-life, real-world consequences for families if it is. Let's talk about illegal children flooding into our schools. Well, you know, I, all I know is that this has been happening since the 80s. People, you know, there's been millions of people coming across our border. One thing, the American public got an opportunity to see a snapshot of what's been happening on that border this past summer when the mainstream media for the first time and other media outlets went down there and saw it and saw how porous the border was. And so the American public, I think, has changed their tune a little bit on this open border idea and illegal immigration. There, 
for, for a few years in this town in D.C., the, the words border security have been sort of a bad word. If you said it and you were in favor of it, you were often confused of being a racist or being cold-hearted. But I think the American public are now beginning to see why it's important to secure the border, and I think people in D.C. are starting to get a backbone. But look, there's no question if people... If, you know, the millions, of, somewhere between 10 and 20 million people who've come to this country since the 1986 Act, the last time they did comprehensive immigration reform, if they're here, and the more that are going to come in with the executive order, apparently about 4 million, of course it's going to impact every aspect of local and county government and state government, including the schools. And I think that's why the governors, 17 governors, got together and filed that lawsuit by um, – Led by a new incoming attorney or, or governor of Texas, because they're the ones who are going to, you know, feel the brunt of the cost of all, all these new folks coming into their system. It's absolutely terrifying. Just like the implementation of Obamacare that was delayed until after the November fourth elections, people are going to be starting to feel that pain. Uh, the idea that our schools, which are already struggling, which uh, we we don't even we barely even rate with some of the other advanced cultures around the world now in our education system, uh, we're having to teach in multiple languages and devote significant resources to uh, pr- promote you know diverse cultures. And and I'm all about learning and the melting pot and that sort of thing. But what happened to assimilation? That's what made our immigration system the envy of the world. Yeah. And look, America is a very generous country, has been forever, will continue to be. And we've helped millions of people, will continue to help millions of people. But I think as a sovereign, we have a right to say how and in what manner people come into our country. And they're not supposed to just come pouring in under a fence or over a river illegally. If, and look, if, you, if it's the right thing to do to bring this number of people in, and then let's do it, let's do it right. Let's do it legally. Let's secure the border first. And then have a vote on the floor of the House or Senate as to how many, how high you want to raise that bar. Do you want to let 10 million people in from these countries or 20 million people in? Let's have a vote and see where people come down on it. Yeah, and my concern is that the Republicans, the leadership in the Republican being funded and fueled by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the, and the big corporations, we really have a corporatist-led Republican Party right now. So I think that they do want it, in spite of their campaign rhetoric, saying they'd stop this illegal amnesty. I, I think many who are in leadership in the Republican Party are for this, and that we are at great risk that uh, Obama's illegal amnesty is going to be funded, at least for the short term, by the end of this week. What do you think? I, well, I think. Look, I think if the people, I think if the Republicans, when they take over in January, um, make the mistake of, of putting, you know, doing an arm's length immigration bill that doesn't do what the voters have spoken about in the last six months before that election, I think they'll be making a mistake. But I, I do understand the idea of trying to do something now with this continuing resolution. The, one, you know, the idea was to do one continuing resolution for the, until the, uh, the end of September of next year, and the other one was separately for just Homeland Security to get it through the end of February and then be forced to revisit it again. Um, there's some logic to that because, look, Republicans haven't even, you know, nothing's changed as of today than the day, the day before the election. Republicans will get sworn in in January, but more Republicans in the House and they get to take over the Senate in January. It gives them a chance to get their feet on the ground and then take a swing at this. Um, I, you know, I'm hopeful. I guess I'm hopeful that given that opportunity in January and February that they'll do something substantive before the uh, Homeland Security um, spending runs out in uh, March 1st. Hopefully they'll try to do something on the substantive side, and hopefully we'll have something, you know, a, a border security-centric um, bill that they might send over. I've heard that they might send a separate border security bill to the Senate and then let them figure out a way to couple it with whatever's in the Senate bill that's worthwhile from last year and then maybe send that to the president. The president says he wants to do border security. Well, let's let him get a chance to do it. And keep in mind, the president keeps saying, well, if the, if the House would just pass that Senate bill from last year, S-744, then we could just resolve this. And obviously that's not true. That bill, it's a huge bill, 1,200 pages, has some good things in it, talks a lot about border security, but it doesn't actually require the border to be secured. And that's why the Republicans in the House haven't passed it. Maybe starting in January they can start a new, come up with a border security bill and send that over to the Senate. Yeah, how about one issue at a time where the people can understand it, where you can hold them accountable? Uh, we do not need a mini, a mini Obamacare 
type immigration bill, that's for sure. Immigration expert and author Roger Fleming, uh, thanks for being with our morning show audience today. We've linked up to your book, Majority Rules, on our Facebook page, Wake Up with Randy Corcoran, where people can take a sneak peek and look inside. Uh, really appreciate your time this morning. Have a great rest of the week. You're listening to the best of Wake Up with Randy P. Corporate. I uh, met or at least saw John King. He just sat in the back at an Arapaho Tea Party meeting before the elections in November of 2014. And uh, he tweeted and talked about his trip across the country looking at these Senate races. And uh, we had him on the show to talk about that and uh, have really been enjoying his show on CNN Inside Politics. It airs at 630 in Denver. So when I'm not er up early, I always record it on the DVR. And, and yep, it's me, your Arapaho Tea Party leader, the host of the Wake Up Call for the Liberty Movement in Colorado. I really, really enjoy your show Inside Politics on CNN. John King, welcome back to the show. Randy, I appreciate that. I wish I could be there to ask a question tonight or to watch you strap Cory Gardner to the chair, I guess. <laughs> I, what do you think about that? I mean, here here we have a guy, Cory Gardner, I don't know how closely you've followed his career, but he was elected to Congress on the Tea Party wave of 2010. Right. He, go ahead. No, I think that's, I think you're exactly right. So now, And now there's some suspicion, as I saw at your meeting when I was there, as to whether he's become... You know, to establishment. It was the establishment, of course, that handpicked him and essentially forced Ken Buck and the other candidate out of the race um, by saying, here's where the money goes. So, I, look, I think we're at this defining moment in the passage of Promnibus and what we've seen in the lame duck session, which is now over. The next time Congress convenes, it will be a fully Republican Congress. Um, I think that, you know, if you're a Tea Party conservative, you should be on the one hand celebrating, and I suspect you're also a tad suspicious about Speaker Boehner, about Leader McConnell, and about these guys who were once, you think, part of your army who you're now a little suspicious about. So um, I think it's good for him that he's doing this. I give him credit for that, and I think this, this should be a model for all of them. Uh, is they should come home and they should meet their constituents, and they should, if there's heat, they should take the heat and answer the question. Yeah, I, what my sense has been, and this is talking to um, national commentators, reading, um, talking to our local folks here, that there's really a huge amount of disappointment. There is not a lot of excitement about this Republican Congress because the conservatives that worked so hard to defeat Democrats in the 2014 elections expected these politicians to keep their promises, and that was to stop Obama's executive amnesty order, to start reining in the spending in the federal government. And instead, what they did is they made this quick deal to put this budget behind them and basically adopted the vast majority of the Democrat agenda for spending right through September of 2015. And so now you have that lingering frustration and disappointment that comes in, although there will be some early tests as to whether you can look at this two ways. So are they just, you know, uh, compromising their principles away, and do they just want to keep sort of the status quo in Washington where the conservatives get a budget that's okay for them, but certainly not great, um, and, and the president gets much of what he wants, not everything. The president had to give some things up in this compromise. So, so it was a sort of a true compromise, but it's, if you're a principled, if you get to the, the vote for the immigration money, for example, you know, that money's in there, the president gets it if you're a Tea Party conservative or even they don't have to be in the Tea Party. If you're a conservative, you think that was a mistake, and you could list a long list of others. The question is what happens next. Uh, number one, they'll revisit the immigration fight pretty early because Homeland Security's money only goes for a couple of months. Uh, the rest of the budget is funded through the end of September. But you will see the immigration issue come back up very, very early, and that will be a test for the Speaker and for Majority Leader McConnell um, to see whether they can, number one, uh, pass legislation and send some things to the president that he might veto, um, and, and, but also stand up for you, know, you can you can you can win by losing in the sense that the president does have the veto pen. So repealing Obamacare is going to be incredibly hard. Reversing these executive actions is going to be incredibly hard. But that doesn't you can still try uh, and you can frame the political debate by trying and, and try to back the president to the tour corner. And a lot of this, Randy, whether we like it or not, and that campaign's already underway. A lot of this just because of the dynamics of a Democratic president in a Republican Congress now, a lot of these contentious issues are going to carry over to 2016. There's just no way around it. 
Yeah, these decisions are being made uh, with this supposed master plan. Well, how are people going to react over time? But haven't we learned, haven't Republicans learned by now that their worries about the short-term mainstream media negative attention, for instance, the kind that emanates from a government shutdown, really doesn't hurt a thing? That if you took the time that you have between now and 2016, the next election, to actually start making the case to say, hey, you sent us here to stop an agenda and that's what we're going to do. Here Here's a funding bill for this program. Here's a funding bill for that program. Democrats, it's up to you. Mr. President, it's up to you to sign that and reopen those branches of government. Wouldn't this have been the time? Because I don't see Democrats not fighting with every tool they have, even when they're in the minority. But the Republicans tend to capitulate. Yeah, I think that's a great question in the sense that the, the view among many conservatives when you talk to them at the grassroots level is that it's the Republicans who keep blinking. Uh, that after the government shutdown that we went through you know, a little more than a year ago, uh, Boehner and McConnell decided we're never going to do this again. And since the president knows that, and since Terry Reid knows that, um, that's where that gives them the advantage. That the, at the, they, yes, they have to give the Republicans some things. And they did give Republicans some things in this compromise, but they didn't have to give them a ton. And they knew in the end that Boehner and McConnell would figure it out. Um, and so you have this frustration on the conservative side of it. Why don't we push them to the brink? Why don't we force them to have to, you know, make this decision and see if they'll blink at the crossroads? And I do think that will be a question going forward. Now, you know, I'm not defending him by any means, uh, but or them by any means, but the speaker and soon to be majority leader McConnell, they do have a difficult job in the sense that, you know, in Mitch McConnell's case, he has a Susan Collins of Maine, uh, who is nothing like you might be a little skeptical about Cory Gordon from Colorado. Uh, but a hey, Susan Collins from Maine is a you know, liberal Republican compared to a um, Cory Gardner of Colorado. And he does have to herd the sheep, and that's not an easy job. Um, however, um, you know, here's a guy who he knows. Look, McConnell knows what's going on here. He ran last year saying his goal was to crush the Tea Party. And he believes he's the Republican leader, the majority leader of the United States Senate. That was his publicly stated goal, was to crush an element of his own party, his own movement. And he believes he succeeded. Uh, so, of course, this huge suspicion uh, that's probably too kind of a word for what most Tea Party people think of Mitch McConnell. And I think it's one of the most fascinating dynamics into the next year. Does he realize this is part of his family and he needs to prove um, that he cares and he needs to prove that he's listening? Or does he be defiant about it and continue? You know, and if he does, we'll see McConnell, Ted Cruz, McConnell, Mike Lee. Uh, and then the question will be, does, uh, does a Cory Gardner... Stay with Mitch McConnell through all those fights, or does a Cory Gardner at some point peel off and say, Mr. Leader, uh, this is too much. Uh, you know, I owe, I owe this to my constituents, and I'm standing with these guys. Uh, those are the things we're going to be watching for uh, pretty early in 2015. Boy, isn't that the truth. We're talking with John King, the CNN chief national correspondent in Washington, D.C. So you get input from all around the country, but it all gets synthesized kind of through that Washington Beltway outlook. And that's why it's so interesting and compelling to talk to you. My, my belief is that the Republicans have no idea what they've done. When you have a New York Times national best-selling author like Brad Thor tweeting out a tweet that goes viral, hey, Reince, hey, GOP, let me be perfectly clear. If Jeb Bush is the nominee, I will never vote Republican again. I think people like Mitch McConnell have to be careful what they wish, wish for, because I can tell you as an insider with national Tea Party groups, uh, chairman of the largest Tea Party organization in Colorado, I'm told that um, we're not going anywhere. We are getting smarter, better, more well-funded, more inside the party. And this fight is far from over. It's going to be very, very interesting. That's for sure. Hey, John, think, can you, can you stay with right us? I about that in the sense that 2014 was probably not a great year for the Tea Party if you go through each ballot, each election. However, sometimes uh, when you get pushed back a little bit, that's when you learn to you know, retool and recover and get back up. That's the challenge. Well, absolutely. And it's in these off years that grassroots activists can make the most difference getting uh, conservatives into positions of leadership in state and county parties into these local municipal election seats onto school boards and that sort of thing. And um, uh, I I don't know. I, I think the swing, the momentum back against the establishment wing of the Republican Party is going to be huge. And if they don't realize it in time, they will not win a presidential election. Can you stay with us through a break? I'd love to finish the sure, show absolutely. with you. All right. Fantastic. That's John King, host of Inside Politics. It airs in Denver on Sundays before State of the Union at 630 a.m. I DVR it every single Sunday now. It really is a fantastic show. I encourage everybody to watch it. You're listening to the best of Wake Up with Randy P. Corporate. 
KLZ Morning Show, Wake Up with Randy Corcoran. We're joined by John King, the CNN national correspondent based out of Washington, D.C., host of the excellent Sunday morning program, Inside Politics, that airs at 6.30 a.m. Denver time on CNN. And when we went to break, John, I left you with the question that uh, from my assessment of the vast majority of victories, including right here in, in Colorado, Corey Gardner, uh, who did have a bit of an energy platform, some generalities there, but there was great talk about reigning and stopping the executive amnesty, securing the border, reducing the size of the federal government. Let's shake up the Senate was the tagline for Senator Cory Gardner. Those were Tea Party principles. Mitch McConnell said he wanted to destroy the Tea Party. That certainly didn't work. I think he agitated it and energized it. But the bottom line for me is that these Republicans were running on those constitutionally conservative principles. That's what got them elected. What don't they get about that equation? Or do you see it differently? No, I, I don't see it differently. I, I think that, look, there's natural tension between a, a Mitch McConnell who wants to be a governing conservative and some of the grassroots base that uh, still sees President Obama as the biggest threat and wants to be more of an opposition party uh, to say no. Uh, McConnell's trying to strike deals, and a lot of people out in the grassroots say, you know, don't talk to this guy. Whatever he's for, we're pretty much always going to be against it because we know who he is. So the challenge is how do you prove, how do you prove to your people, uh, especially in an environment where, look, they probably can't repeal Obamacare. The president has the veto pen. They don't have the Democratic votes to override him. That doesn't mean they shouldn't try. They promised in the election they would. So they should have another vote. They should send it to the president. And if he vetoes it, then, Randy, the challenge is what do they do next? Um, do they, you know, take out the medical device tax? Uh, do they do some other things? Uh, the Supreme Court may help, by the way. If the Supreme Court could change the whole dynamic of the Obamacare debate, if it says the subsidies are unconstitutional, because that takes the, the money, the financial infrastructure, right out of the program, and you'd be almost back to square one. But if that, if, until that happens, or if that doesn't happen, the challenge then for McConnell and Boehner is to prove to the grassroots um, that we cannot fully succeed until we elect a re- re- Republican president, but we're going to keep we're going to keep picking at it, and we're going to pass the things we can pass it, and that will require sitting down with conservative Democrats like a Joe Manchin from West Virginia, and because you will still need to probably override a presidential veto. But there are some things where they could probably get to 60 votes or 60 plus in the Senate if they did it incrementally. Uh, but first, I think their commitment to the voters is to try to get the, you know to go after the whole thing. The, the president will veto it if they pass it, but I do think they owe it to their voters to prove that they're at least going to send it to the president and force him to make that decision. Well, here's the thing that I think has the grassroots so skeptical, the people who really have been paying attention, who have long memories, who remember John Boehner promising us that we'll take on Obamacare at the next continuing resolution. And then when it was too tough then at the debt ceiling, that's when we'll pick up this fight. And then we get past that debt ceiling with promises of fighting before the next continuing uh, resolution and the next so-called budget deal. These aren't even budgets, really. Uh, A lot of people who have been watching the establishment wing, the donor wing, the Karl Rove wing of the Republican Party for a long time, we believe that the Republican establishment wants many of these things to succeed. Big business, the Chamber of Commerce, they are pushing for amnesty. The front runner for the establishment Republicans, Jeb Bush, wants an amnesty. So the grassroots just simply doesn't trust that they mean what they say because we think they have the ulterior motives and they're doing exactly what they want to do. They're not powerless. They're just letting the blame lie on the president and moving the agenda forward anyway. What do you think? I think you raised, I think the fundamental point right now is that sometimes success brings problems. And the Republican Party in the Obama years, with the exception of the presidency, has had giant success. You were talking about this before the break. Um, now you're going to have 54 United States senators. You have the biggest House Republican majority since World War II, 31 Republican governors. And the biggest thing that has happened in the Obama years is nearly a 1,000 state legislative seats have switched from Democrats to Republicans. So Republicans are growing this bench, uh, most of them, as you say, elected in the Tea Party years on, on, on conservative Tea Party principles in a lot of cases. And so the, the map and, and the math has changed dramatically in favor of Republicans and conservatives. And you and I know sometimes there's a difference. Uh, uh, But that has changed dramatically. The question is, does Washington change? Or does Washington still play by the old, uh, you know, um, just the way we do stuff, we split the difference, we do the math? Now, I'll say this, uh, you know, again, this is not to defend them, but the old practice in Washington for both parties has been you promise something, and then you get close to the vote or the close to the moment where you would have to do it, and you realize you don't have the votes, and you just back away. Right? You just back away because we don't have the votes. And, and, and some, you know, you can sort of understand that from a 
you don't want to lose standpoint. However, I think that the skepticism, the credibility of these leaders is so low uh, with their own base uh, that they need to actually have those votes and, and prove they're trying and, and make make people see and see it as clearly as possible that it was the president's veto pen, not Republicans just shying away from the fight. But you are right. You have a, you're you're, a, you're part of a family now where the Chamber of Commerce, which is a big slice of the family and gives a lot of money to the family, it wants legal status. Or it wants the path to citizenship. Uh, it wants expanded gifts worker programs. Um, it would probably work with you on tougher border security as well, um, but it wants some things that you don't. And this is your Thanksgiving dinner is getting a lot bigger. Uh, and you've got more cousins and more in-laws uh, at it now. And the question is, can you find, are there principles compromises to some of these fights? Or you just simply, or, or in some of these cases, are you just going to have to understand that even within the family, uh, these are profound disagreements that cannot be settled, and that means you carry the fight over into the next election, and maybe the next one, and maybe the next one. Uh, and you know, and some of these fights will not be settled because they are so divisive, and they're matters of principle. Well, I just love the Thanksgiving dinner analogy. That uh, I will be left with that one for sure. John King, national correspondent for CNN, uh, really appreciate your time this morning. I do encourage everybody to, if they're not up early on Sunday, DVR the show Inside Politics airs at 6.30 on Sunday morning. I guarantee you, you will find it to be an objective and refreshing look at Washington, D.C. Beltway politics. I wish you a very Merry Christmas. Happy New Year, sir. I hope you'll come back and join us in 2015. Thank you very much for your insights this morning here in Denver. I sure will. Merry Christmas to you and all your listeners as well, Randy. Take care. All right. John King from CNN. And uh, that's about a wrap on the Wednesday edition, hump day edition of the KLZ Morning Show. Thanks to everybody. All the calls, Zach Pugh behind the glass. We've been really, really busy this morning. Final reminder, tonight at 5 o'clock, 5 to 6, at the Colorado Republican Party, 5950 South Willow Drive, Suite 305 in Greenwood Village. Senator-elect Cory Gardner will be there for a meet and greet. Bring your cameras. Bring your smart and short and succinct questions. And be ready for the follow-up if you get the chance. Really, really important that we show up every time one of these politicians is available to us. And not to beat them up, not to attack them, not to fight with them, but to question them and get them on the record answering those very, very important questions. How are you going to govern as we move forward? Because we have a lot of decisions to make. Hey, it's Randy Corcoran. Thanks for listening to the podcast of our show, Wake Up with Randy Corcoran. Don't forget, I'm chairman of the Arapahoe County Tea Party. Our meetings are the second Tuesday of every month at 6.30 p.m. with candidates, elected officials, and topics of interest to freedom lovers everywhere. No matter where you're listening, please find us on Facebook and Google the Arapahoe Tea Party. You're listening to the best of Wake Up with Randy P. Corporate. Thanks for sticking around for the second hour of the Friday edition of the KLZ Morning Show. I'm Randy Corcoran, and I took a few deep breaths over the hour, I uh, over the break. I was getting a little worked up there with our bash bushing, as I now refer to the bashing of bushes. And uh, we had a caller at the beginning of the 5 o'clock hour who asked that we talk about... Um, you know, the importance of getting elected as bonus members, getting elected as district captains, those kinds of things as we approach the local elections. And I just want to promise that we will talk about that next week. Bottom line is go to your county website, read the bylaws, understand how district captains and precinct leaders and bonus members get either elected or appointed. That's the big deal. We'll get into the details on that next week, but we are going to pull way back from local and national politics and talk about real-life issues. Mark Baisley was with us yesterday for his regular Thursday visit to the vice chairman of the Colorado State Republican Party, and and when the show was over, we were talking about this decision by Barack Obama to supposedly normalize relationships with the Castro brothers. And Mark has a very unique history. If you've been listening to the show or you know Mark, you you understand that uh, this is somebody who has some unique perspectives to bring to every conversation. And he told me that he had high school friends, Miguel and Lily Escasina, who are Cuban exiles. He actually went to high school with them in Puerto Rico, and they're now living in South Florida with some very strong opinions and 
and unique perspectives on this decision by Barack Obama to extend this olive branch to Cuba. So, Mark, let's start with you. Let's welcome you back to the show. Thank you very much for putting this together for us. This should be a fascinating conversation with your friends. Well, well, thanks, Randy. Yeah, it will be fascinating. You know, when, when Marianne and I, my, my uh, lovely wife, uh, she and I are high school sweethearts, both lived in, in Puerto Rico in the uh, late 60s and then in, on into the 70s. Uh, and we we didn't realize this phenomenal story that was unfolding around us as uh, as young teens uh there but but we did realize this there's kind of a, a something special about the cubanos the, the cuban folk who also lived there in puerto rico they uh they were so industrious there was just something special about these these folk that the um Miguel uh, Mickey Escasena, who uh, who will come on here in a moment, he and his his brothers were like the most phenomenal athletes. Our, our high school would play against the the local uh, U.S. Navy base bases and Air Force bases and uh, other private schools there, and um, and they were they were our top athletes. They they were the ones that that built the businesses around there. There was something very special going on with this uh, Cuban community. And then as we got, got to learn later what their personal history was in uh, leaving the island, a couple, couple islands over from Cuba and uh, exiling out to, uh, to Puerto Rico and uh, rebuilding their lives. And we, we didn't realize back then just how, what a, a big story that was all around us, but it's very impressive, and these people lived it. So, so when this is now uh, something something that has uh, been brought to the fore by our president's recent action, then yeah, it made sense. Let's let's ask them. Let's ask the folks who who escaped from the Castro brothers regime and are living in the U.S. and um, what's their perspective on this? So, I, I really appreciate you bringing this up, Randy, and, and uh, inviting Lily and, and Mickey Escasena. To, uh, to share their story and others that might call in. Well, Mr. and Mrs. Escasena, thank you very much for your time this morning. Welcome to the KLZ Morning Show in Denver. Thank you so much. <clears throat> We're really excited to talk to the people of Denver from Miami. Thank you, Randy. You betcha. Now, let's let's just start. We're going to take all the time we need and uh, because I really want people to understand the the powerful humanity of your story. Let's talk about... First of all, what do you remember of life in Cuba? At, at what point was there the beginning of considering, hey, we've got to get out of here? How how does that unfold when, you know, when kids are born and they're raised up in an environment that's that's really all they know? Yeah, Randy. And uh, first, I guess let me give you a little bit of background uh, of my family. I'm actually a fifth generation uh, Cuban uh, descendant. Uh, my my forefathers came from Spain. Um, this was pre, pre-Cuba being a republic, so we belong to Spain, and I am des- a descendant of Spanish um, d- descendants. So I'm a fifth generation. Um, actually, m- one of my forefathers then later uh, fought uh, for the independence uh, from Cuba, from, from Spain. And then my grandfather was director of justice under four uh, different presidents in Cuba, at right after um, the Machado regimen, and he was one of the first uh, uh, Cuban presidents uh, elected democratically. So uh, my grandfather's um, influence in, in Cuba was that he was director of justice. And um, one of the things that when, when the first Cuban president, I mean Machado, was elected president for the first term, it was democratically elected. And Cuba was just really just starting to boom economically. You know, infra- the infrastructure of Cuba really started to grow. The problem arised in the, in the 1930s when the, then Congress decided to eliminate the free elections and leave this president, and now he became a dictator. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of background. My, my grandfather was very involved at that time with the... the um, um, the Ambassador Wells, uh, and also letters with, uh, with President Roosevelt on the problems that were occurring in Cuba. So you can see that, you know, I have a long line of history of Cuba involvement, and my forefathers were 
like you could say they were they were part of the building of Cuba back then. It's now, very, very, um, very fascinating. Let's stop it there for just one second, because I'd like to get a little bit of the background of your wife, Lily Escasena. Lily? Well, my family um, was, I could say, you know, we have, uh, we don't have the long line of uh, history that Mickey has, um, because my uh, grandfather actually was born in Cuba. My great-grandparents were, came from Spain, like a lot of other Cubans. And um, they were poor. Um, my grandfather lost his uh, father when he was young. So he basically started working at, uh, when he was nine years old. And he built his uh, business uh, since very early on. He worked very hard. And um, my, my parents were just, you know, the normal Cuban going about, you know, uh, forming Cuba, working. Um, my mom uh, came to the United States and was educated in the United States in New York. So she was uh, very culturally uh, open and very, um, she understood basically the, the basic, inter- basic principles of, of of what uh, a true government and, and, and so the, all that has been instilled in us. We um, left early, very early in the 1960s. My mom, as, as I said, she uh, was very concerned with what was happening in Cuba and my dad uh, knew that uh, Fidel was not bringing anything positive um, in terms of change. So, All right. Well, let's let's stop it right there, and it's a good spot as we begin to transition to how the two of you, the decisions that were made, your experiences in Cuba, right up to when you were able to leave there. Let's pick up that part of the story when we come back. Cuba is all over the news. The president has extended an olive branch, not to the people of Cuba, but to the dictators ruling over her. And we have the distinct pleasure and privilege of talking to Miguel and Lily Escasena, courtesy of our good friend Mark Baisley, and we'll continue that conversation when we get back. 617 The Morning Show. Stay with us on KLZ 560. So grateful to have you with us on the KLZ Morning Show. I'm Randy Corcoran. It's Wake Up right here on KLZ 560 621. And Mark Baisley was gracious enough to bring us together this morning with our guests, Mickey and Lily Escasena, Cuban exiles who now live in South Florida. In the first segment, we talked a little bit about the background. Mr. Escasena is a fifth-generation Cuban. Uh, His wife, Lily, uh, grandmother from Spain, mother educated in America, living in Cuba, starting to realize pretty early on, it sounds like in the 60s, that uh, Fidel Castro did not have good designs for the future of Cuba. So let's pick it up with Mickey. And um, um, your wife kind of framed the issue right before, uh, you know, talking about escaping from Cuba. How did that realization come together for you and your family? Well, I remember that, um, you know, uh, in my family were six boys. Uh, my, my dad and mother, um, father and mother had six boys in our family. And uh, I remember that the state, uh, Fidel Castro told my father, that his sons belong no longer to him and they belong to the state. Uh, in fear that they would take us to concentration camps, um, my father decided that, you know, we had to leave Cuba. And um, under the pretext that we were leaving on a vacation uh, with our suitcases, we were able to board on an airplane, and uh, we had family living here in the United States. So uh, that's how we were able to leave and never returning. Uh, we left everything that we owned, um, and we just came with our suitcases here to the United States. What incredible courage that must have taken. Now, how old were you at that time, Mickey? At that time, I was uh, five years old. So you're five. Do you have, for instance, I have recollections. I was four years old when John F. Kennedy was shot, and I, I still have recollections ingrained in my memory of the black and white TV sitting off of our kitchen 
with uh, Walter Cronkite talking about the death and my mother silently crying at uh, at the kitchen sink and not really understanding what was happening, but realizing something very, very profound had occurred. At five years old, did you have a sense that you were leaving your home, that uh, going into this new, I suppose, adventure, but it had to be terrifying as well? It was. It was terrifying, and, uh, you know, coming to to a country where you don't speak the language, um, you know, we, we, it was, you know, it it was hard. It was, you know, um, very difficult for my parents not speaking the language with six children um, and starting in a new country. Um, I really look up to my parents in that sense and have great admiration for my, uh, for my parents. Um, not allowing us to stay in Cuba and, um, you know, being brought up under a communist uh, country. Let me ask you this before we get to Lily and and her escape story. When you were brought to America by your parents, five other brothers, uh, a huge family, didn't speak the language. Was What was your parents' approach to adapt to or assimilate into American culture? Well, one of the, uh, the the things that my my father uh, taught me was hard work. That um, you know, all he had was um, his name, um, his integrity, and hard work. What about language? Were you were you required, for instance, to begin speaking English and trying to learn that language as quickly as you could? How how does that work? Because now, of course, we have schools that have to teach in multiple languages and and the results of the outcomes for students like that have been hampered for uh, the the native students as well as the immigrant students. What what was the approach of a a man like your father's who had the courage to actually uproot himself and his family to come to America at a time when all of these safety blankets weren't necessarily in place? Well, that's one of the things that... um you know, we try to explain to the people. I mean, when we came here, we had very little help, um, and we had to assimilate and adapt and learn the language. Um, you have a lot of people now coming from Cuba that don't even speak English but have no interest in learning or speaking English. They um, they want to remain in their own little world, and and um, so so. You know, it, it, it was very difficult for us um, at the time, and people don't understand the sacrifices that we had to make, whereas now the people that come over um, kind of have demands on that, um, you know, they're entitled to um, all these privileges and, and, and so forth. From, from your perspective, and then we'll get to Lily and her story of escape from Cuba, uh, the have the changes been a positive has been making it easier for people to come in and not try and adapt to an American culture, this balkanization that I see uh, from these different cultures, trying to simply hang on to what they have rather than assimilate, not, not give up, not, not be ashamed of or walk away from, you know, continue to celebrate their heritages, but no longer trying to assimilate into America in the Cuban community uh, where you're involved Net positive, net loss. I, I would think uh, a little bit of a net loss because now it's becoming more of an economic issue. Um, there, you know, families are coming here to now help support their families in Cuba and to, you know, be sending money over there. So it's now rather than a, a political freedom, it's more of a uh, economic freedom that they're they're looking for. So, Lily Escasena, wife of Mickey, how um, how old were you when you and your family left Cuba, and what were the circumstances? Um, in the 1960s, I was only three years old. I was, All right. had just turned three. My parents left in December of 1960. We, um, were, we were three girls at the time, and plus two other stepsisters that I have, and, um, you know, my story is a little different. Uh, my mom, being educated in the United States, she went to college in New York. Uh, she obviously had a broader vision. And at the time, you know, it was pretty chaotic in Cuba. 
there was a lot of, of feelings that, I, that were going on between Fidel um, talking about change and, uh, you know, breaking from the old um, dictatorship of Batista. Um, it, there, was, there was a lot of fear, and I think what drove my, my parents, basically, my, especially my mom, because my mom, you know, I want to say took really the lead in, in leaving Cuba uh, because she was very fearful of our lives as, as, as girls and obviously um, for, for her family. She felt that, um, that she couldn't trust anybody. Um, you know, we had people working in the house, and she couldn't say anything. So I, I'm very, very proud of the way she carried herself and, and diligently um, worked with the American Embassy at the time to get us tourist visa. I remember in the 1960s, um, people were, were just, you know, that you could leave Cuba with a tourist visa. It wasn't closed by Fidel yet. So basically, um, we followed pretty much um, what um, Mickey's family did. Um, my mom got a tourist visa, and um, and we just, you know, based with the bare essentials, um, we left Cuba. Now, my dad, thinking that um, it could, it was impossible for something like that to happen in Cuba, 90 miles away, and with all the um, influence and the um, U.S. Uh, presence in Cuba that that really couldn't happen. That that you know people were, you know people were divided. That's let's put it that way. People were divided. People were some happy that there was change, and people were concerned. And my parents were on the concern side. So my dad, you know, decided to stay. Um, but <laughs> um, like. Many Cubans, uh, my dad's uh, business was one of the first businesses that was uh, expropriated by the government, and my dad feared for his life because he had a uh, dynamite manufacturing company. So you can mm. imagine that's one of the first things sure. they're going to take over. So, um, yeah, the, 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 the militia came in into uh, the company, and... My dad was alerted, and this is the story that I know, of course, by my parents. And uh, my dad left to directly to the American embassy and took a flight here uh, to Miami. Well, one, so, one, one thing that I get from just listening to this part of your story is your both of you have such deep love and appreciation for your heritages. I could hear the, the loving way that you described your backgrounds, and, uh, of course, the courage of your parents to make these incredible moves, leaving and packing up with suitcases, uh, three girls in one family, six boys in the other. And so I'm assuming, and we'll pick this up on the other side of the break, but I'm, I'm assuming that that love of culture and that love of country has caused you to be very aware of and really tuned in to what's been happening in Cuba. So is it safe to say that you um, have been aware of the changes in Cuba and the the government there over these many decades now and that you have some pretty strong and well-founded views on what's happening with President Obama trying to supposedly normalize relationships with the Castro brothers? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. All right. So let's talk about that then when we come back. It's already 632 uh, radio talk radio. No man, it's master the clock rules. And we'll continue our conversation with Miguel and Lily Escasena. We've got another caller on the line with a, an important story to share as well. And Mark Baisley is with us on the KLZ Morning Show. Stay with us. We will get these very important perspectives from people whose love of Cuba and their history and their tradition is clear in their conversations about it. And uh, my sense from the little bit of conversation I had with Mark Baisley is that they think that what Barack Obama is doing is a very, very bad idea. So stay with us on KLZ 560. I'm Randy Corfin. It's good to have you along. We had scheduled at 630... Uh, one of my many friends from Leadership Program of the Rockies, Anders Igmarson, we were going to talk about how to police your Congress critter, and he has graciously agreed to move to Monday so that we can continue our conversation with Miguel and Lily Escasena. 
And uh, we'll also be joined by Steve Dace on Monday, so uh, lots of reasons to be listening to the morning show every single day. At 7 o'clock, constitutional super scholar Professor Thomas Cranowitter is back on the show, and 7.30, Jordan Seculo, the executive director from the American Center for Law and Justice, co-author of the new book, The Rise of ISIS. So, um, man, oh, man, just a bang-up show today, but right now, an important conversation that we're having with actual Cuban exiles, people who've been living in southern Florida. They met our good friend Mark Baisley in high school when Mark was in high school in Puerto Rico. And Mark, before I go back to your um, high school friends, you know their history uh, better than anybody. Is there anything else that we should hear from these folks before we talk about what's happening now? Well, I I, I suppose... Uh... I'd like to just to, to get to their perspective on on the president that we have. I mean, let's think about if you're if you're six years into the eight years uh, as, of, in the White House and you're a, a socialist and and you're looking to to do as as much changing towards your own socialist theory before you you uh, get out of the White House, what might you you think to do? And I imagine that. We have, a, or he has, uh, a whole lot more surprises up his sleeve over the next uh, 20 months or so. This one is a big deal. If he thinks, well, where's, there, where's the one communist regime that he can relate to on some level that's within our, our continent, or I'm sorry, within our uh, hemisphere? And uh, I know, let's, uh, let, let's make things a little bit easier for them than uh, previous presidents have. Uh, it just amazes me. Anyway, I, I, I know from talking with Mickey and Lily and others that uh, that this has a, a, another facet to it, another dimension to it beyond uh, just normalization with, with our good friends who are the, the Cuban people there. And uh, when, I, when we spoke on the phone, Mickey and Lily and I yesterday, then uh, it was for me very eye-opening, their perspective on what it would really mean not just to the the Cuban folk who are some phenomenal culture, phenomenal people, but um, what does this do to strengthen the Castro brothers um, in in their position? And that's that's my fear. Well, so many people don't realize that the Frank that Barack Obama refers to in his own memoirs is Frank Marshall Davis, a, a communist who was watched carefully by the FBI, would have been arrested uh, had we gone to war while he was living there in Hawaii. Uh, they just don't understand these connections. So there is certainly a broader picture going on here. Ada Diaz is called in as well, and I think this is another friend of yours, Mark, with a very important story to share. So let's get her on real quick, and then we'll go to the perspectives of Ada and your guests and friends, Mickey and Lila Escasena. So, Ada, welcome to The Morning Show. Well, thank you, Randy. It's a little early, but I'm here. <laughs> Wake <laughs> up with Randy Corcoran. That's the name of the game. Exactly. I'm, I'm drinking some Cuban coffee right now. <laughs> that'll, that'll wake you yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> and we got Zach Juice on this end, so we're rocking and rolling. So time is always short on talk radio, but um, you've got an important piece to add as well, so let's hear it. Yeah, well, let, let me just say, um, um, I, I came to the United States like, like um, um, Mickey and, uh, and Lily, uh, you know, I was an exile, I was a refugee, but uh, it was a different story. Uh, it was, uh, I came through it, uh, Operation Peter Pan, where the uh, Cuban refugee, uh, the, the parents, uh, like, like uh, Miguel and Lily were saying, uh, were desperate to get their kids out, and our parents were desperate. My father was in prison for a while for something I had said in school, and, and, and uh, wow. uh, we were being snitched by all of the... Uh, uh, the neighbors were 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 uh, surveilling us. They were stopping us. It, it was uh, you have to almost feel the oppression. I mean, you couldn't walk outside of the house. Uh, my father took us out of school. That was illegal. They changed uh, everything in school. They were teaching, you know, communist ideals, socialist ideals, and and uh, revolutionary things. So, uh, just to set the stage on how desperate our parents were to get us out. They heard about this program through the Catholic Church called the Pedro Pan Program. Uh, um, that uh, Fidel had a lot of pressure uh, from the Pope, uh, even <laughs> you can believe that, a different Pope, to uh, to allow some of the kids to get out. Well, parents were giving just children away 
uh, and putting them in on a plane to to uh, to the United States to uh, in the care of the Catholic Church. I was uh, almost twelve. I went through you know the revolution. I went through the uh, the Bay of Pigs invasion. As a matter of fact, we I don't want to uh, uh, go too too much into it, but our house was bombed uh, during the Bay of Pigs invasion because we were uh, near the nearest airport. So uh, it was very scary. You know, uh, we had to hide. Uh, under mattresses, uh, you know, we were getting bombed everywhere. Uh, parents just um, have to understand, you know, uh, the, the fear that they had to put us alone on a plane, not knowing if they were ever going to see us again, and uh, entrusting us to people they didn't know because they, we didn't have any family in the United States. So we ended up in a refugee, Hector, my brother Hector and I ended up uh, in a refugee camp uh, in Miami. Um, uh, uh, it was very crowded. Most of us were sleeping uh, on the floor or even together in bunk beds. You, they piled us up. Uh, they started dispersing us throughout the United States, and uh, we ended up uh, in an orphanage in Pueblo, Colorado. Um, Anna, that is absolutely remarkable. I'm still stuck on when you said your father was put in prison for something that you said in school. I, it just it it's terrifying. And because we have such horrible time constraints, I would just like to uh, invite you to be a regular caller and a regular friend of the KLZ Morning sure. Show. We go all the way till eight o'clock, so you don't necessarily have to call in at six because I'd love to hear more about your story and get your perspective as well. Okay. Maybe, maybe we could do this on Monday, get your perspective on what Barack Obama's uh, trying to do, normalizing relationships with the Castro brothers. Oh, absolutely. I'll be glad. To, I'll be happy to do it, Randy. All right. Thank you very much. And Mark Baisley stays with us, as well do his good friends, his high school friends, Miguel and Lily Escasena. And I want to get their perspective on the lifting of this embargo and this whole olive branch idea reaching out to uh, the Castro brothers in Cuba when we come back. Right now at 645, it's time for a look at Denver's traffic and weather with Zach Pugh, who's got a phone stuck to his ear. So uh, maybe I guess we can push this break a little bit. And uh, let's just at least start the conversation with Miguel and Lily. Uh, what did you think? What was the initial reaction? Lily, we'll start with you first this time. What was your initial reaction when you heard Barack Obama's announcement? Quite honest, Randy, I, I was in disbelief because um, I just couldn't believe that it was such a shocking news to the entire Cuban community. I, I, I always believed that we do want to see, you know, normalizations with Cuba, but it, it was always, we always had the, the hope that this normalization was going to bring about complete change in Cuba, not just economic change. Right, or, Get, getting su sorry. supporting the Cuban people if they somehow were able to rise up and overthrow the Castros, or if the Castros died out and some new leadership idea started to grow in Cuba, then, then you would want American influence, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean... I think we, I mean, we got to go back to the basics. Why was the embargo um, there from the beginning? And, uh, and from the beginning is because these this Castro brothers, all they did was, uh, was steal and murder. Um, they're complete thugs in, 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 you know, in the minds of the world. They were never, they're never elected as, <laughs> as president. I mean, they, they were, they just, you know, are dictators that, you know, all they did was divide a, a, a country. And, uh, you know, you have to think about all the, the people that have died through these over 50 years of them being in Cuba, um, how they, they destroy the entire country, how they um, also um, send out their own to be killed. I mean, you know, we, we can go back, you know, to the years of Angola. Um, we can go back to, to, to trying to, to, he sent out a young kids, you know, which he felt he owned, you know, to, to, to go to other countries to, to, 
spread uh, communism and and it's just you know it's just very very um i don't know i think it's it's so deep rooted our 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 feelings of 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 it's it's just sad i don't know how to explain to you i was telling mark yesterday that it's a very emotional um talk when you're talking about the embargo the cuban community because so so many lives have been at stake and so much has happened that well, and and isn't it true lily and then we'll stop it here get to our final break so we can try and have a good long segment on the other side but um, that every american dollar that goes into cuba winds up in the pockets of the castros and then those dollars are exchanged for these cuban pesos that are worth nothing as a world currency uh, is it? Absolutely. I mean, you have to. Every company. I mean, when you the Spanish, the Spaniards, the French, anybody who's doing business in Cuba, everything goes through Castro. They're the ones that assign the wages. There's, I mean, there's no infra, there's no economic infrastructure in Cuba. Let's put it that way. All right. There let's is- let's stop it there because I do want to get uh, Mickey's take. Miguel Escasina, Mark Baisley's friend, uh, his wife Lily have been with us the entire hour. Really do appreciate the time. It's six forty nine. You know, I, I look at this. Uh, I, I think every conservative and and many many Americans who pay any attention to this issue at all believe that engaging Cuba is a good thing if it's done at the right time and in the right way. It's just like when Barack Obama pledged to end the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Everybody can understand that that is a high ideal, but it has to be done in the right way and at the right time. And that is certainly not what's happening right now. When we come back, we will finish our conversation with Miguel and Lily Escasina. Mark Baisley is still on the line with, with us as well. Very important conversation as we try and understand what Barack Obama is trying to do with his olive branch extension of a hand to the Castro brothers in Cuba. Stay with us. Final segment on KLZ 560. Back on the KLZ Morning Show and our final segment, Mark Baisley is on the line and our special guests, his high school friends from Puerto Rico, Miguel and Lily Escasena. And uh, we heard Lily's take on the olive branch being extended by Barack Obama. We've got only, unfortunately, about six minutes left in the this segment of the show. And, Mickey, I really wanted to hear from you as well. Okay, uh, Dan. Um, you know that when I spoke to Mark yesterday and he was asking us our opinion about everything that was happening and what the announcements that had been made uh, with Bar- Barack Obama and relative to uh, Cuba, and, you know, we, we told him that we had a lot of mixed emotions. I mean, we feel for the um, the people in Cuba. Um, we, we know the hardship and, and, and what it is to live under communism. We want, um, we want the best for the Cuban people. We want to see change. What we're opposed is the way that Barack Obama is doing this and his negotiation skills have uh, a lot to be desired. Um, I wanted to um, mention something here that I think will make the point. Um, there's an article here in the paper that says, a members of the Ladies in White opposition movement is arrested by Cuban authorities on Human Rights Day. And this is something how well we feel that the dissidents de- de- were left out. Um, President, uh, President Obama promised the United States would not relent in its efforts to help the Cuban people. So shouldn't he have demanded the inclusion of the dissidents in the discussion with the, Cub- the Cuban government? Instead, he negotiated directly with the Cuban dictatorship. I guarantee that if during the negotiations with a, our, our apartheid regimen in South Africa with Nelson uh, Mandela, if he had not been consulted or included in the discussions, Obama would not have supported such negotiations. Why then the double standard when it comes to Cuba? So, so apparently, you know, he's negotiated with these uh, uh, Castro brothers, the, these two dictator uh, thugs, and yet the, the there's n- there's nothing has been gained by this, uh, you know, lifting of the embargo. And uh, we haven't gotten anything in return. The Cuban people will not reap the benefits of this, only the Fidel Castro brothers. 
Well, there's just no way to look at it any other way because this isn't supporting, you know, a popular uprising or some kind of a political or liberty movement that's going on in Cuba. This is normalizing relations with the dictators. Is there any other way to look at it than that? No. Absolutely not. Okay. So, you know, we've got this Republican wave election that just occurred, a Republican majority stepping into both the House of Representatives and the Senate. Uh, Miguel and Lily Escasena, uh, Cuban nationals who escaped at a very young age, met our good friend Mark Baisley in Puerto Rico at high school there. Is it your hope that the new Republican Congress will stand up and follow the lead of Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz and try and stop every aspect of the so-called normalization of relations? Is there any piece of this that bodes well for Cuba and American relations? You know, this is very bittersweet, Randy, because, like Mickey said, we do want to see the Cuban people have uh, a chance to get out of the misery that they're in right now, you know, and and this is the platform for for change, and and change has to come from within the island. The people of the island need to be able to be free. We need to have better human rights, and we need to let them uh, develop themselves as free people. Um, I do would like to see, yes, Congress and the Senate uh, support Rubio and uh, because um, this is not something that you just, you know, at the snap of your fingers. This has been over 50 years. This is, this is the embargo has been the only bargaining chip that the Cubans have in order to gain change in Cuba. And uh, and just President Obama just gave it away, uh, you know, at a snap of the fingers. I mean, uh, no, this is, you know, he needs to unilaterally bring um, together, um, you know, from both sides of the, of the spectrum, because there are Cubans who support the embargo and there are Cubans who don't. You know, bring us together. Why divide us? Bring us together. Let's get a consensus and then let's proceed with what is right legally to move Cuba out of where they are right now. We're going to have to One of the things that comes to my mind is the type of leadership that we need in this country. You've got about and 15 of, seconds, Mickey. I'm sorry. You're going to have to make it really quick. Well, I think of Ronald Reagan and what he did in bringing down the, uh, the, Eastern, uh, the Eastern Wall. Right. That kind of leadership, which we certainly don't have with this president, plus I, his intentions are not good. This, this was not a move designed to improve uh, the spread of freedom into Cuba. Uh, Miguel and Lily Escasena, I just really appreciate the generosity of your time this morning, and we're just sketching the surface of your story and uh, your views on this. Mark Baisley, uh, thanks very much for helping put this together. I really, really appreciate your time this morning. You've been listening to the podcast of Wake Up with Randy Corcoran. You can access these podcasts anytime at soundcloud.com forward slash Randy Corcoran or at our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Wake Up KLZ. Please show your support by giving us a like and a follow and leave any comments and or feedback you may have. If you'd like to be a guest on our show, please send us your name, a short bio, and the best way we can get back to you. Thanks again for listening to the podcast of Wake Up with Randy Corcoran.